This is the third part of a three-part series on studying for the MCAT. The first part was on resources and the second was on making a study schedule. So make sure to check those out if you haven't seen them already. If you're new here, my name is Danny Kalani. I'm a first year medical student in Canada. The meat of this video is going to be general advice for studying. I'll touch a little bit on some high yield topics that you'll want to make sure to look at before your test day. And to end things off, we'll go into some principles for making some good flashcards. Make sure to check out the timestamps for the most relevant parts of the video for you. Let's start off with how you should distribute content review and practice throughout your study. You might decide to separate your study plan into two distinct phases, those being content review and practice. But instead, I recommend you try out what I call the S-curve approach, which involves primarily content review at the beginning of your studying. Then over time, you'll gradually increase the time that you spend on practice and reduce the time spent on content review. In your practice, you'll specifically want to touch on topics that you've already covered. You can do this in UWorld, for example, by looking at how they categorize their questions and relating that back to what you've covered so far. During content review, you should try and avoid asking yourself the question of, do I need to know this? It's a common question asked in lecture halls and it can become a bad habit when you're studying for the MCAT. If you see something in your resources that you're questioning whether or not you need to learn, you're better off spending your time learning it than spending your time trying to figure out whether or not it's actually relevant. There are many ways to do content review for the MCAT. I'm personally big on Anki, but regardless of your study strategy, it's important that you find ways to continually improve it over time. You're bound to have missteps in your studying, but what's important is that you continue to learn from them and improve the way that you study over time. In summary, be self-reflective over what works and what doesn't. In the same vein, keep a running list of questions that you get wrong or topics that you're weak at. If you want a template for keeping track of your mistakes, check out part two of this series, which I'll link up here. The only section that I achieved a 132 on, or 100th percentile, was the chemistry and physics section of the MCAT. And I think there's a clear cut way to getting a similarly high score. That is, you need to do as much practice as possible. I literally went through every single general chemistry, physics, and organic chemistry that was available to me on UWorld. Then if I got something wrong, I figured out why and I made flashcards to help me remember. Again, practice is the key to scoring high on this section. Next, I want to address a pitfall that I encountered myself during my studying, which is over planning. Productive studying involves a little bit of time spent strategizing and the vast majority of your time spent executing your plan. It can be easy to view spending hours of your time planning as productive, but in reality, the only way to get yourself closer to your dream score is to put in the work. Although it may seem contradictory to what I just said, you should also know when to stop studying. Studying for two to six months is innately a marathon rather than a sprint. For most of us, we have diminishing returns the longer that we study in a day. Remember that there's always tomorrow and that getting enough sleep is essential to learning efficiently. What about having a life outside studying? Is that something that you should strive for? Like I said, the MCAT is a marathon. Imagine that you're an athlete training for your next big competition. You wouldn't compromise your social support and you would rest when you need to. Sometimes our biggest breakthroughs in studying come once we've given our brain a chance to process things in the background. So make sure to take your breaks and use them intentionally. You're also bound to have days where you feel unmotivated and you just can't get started. When this happens, try out the Pomodoro technique, which involves studying for 25 minutes at a time and taking short breaks in between. By breaking studying down into less overwhelming chunks, it can help you get started and give you some momentum to keep you going. Now we're gonna touch on some things that you should absolutely know for the MCAT. This list is by no means a complete representation of what you need to know. It's simply a few highlights that I thought were relevant to mention. The first is amino acids, which are found in tons of biochemistry questions in multitudes of different ways. You should know how to draw them as well as their properties. They're going to be covered in pretty much any content review resource that you use, but I want to point you towards another resource that I use to help make it stick, which is a Quizlet deck. Next are the formulas which you'll come across as you go through content review. You actually don't need to memorize every single formula in the books if you can master something called dimensional analysis. Using dimensional analysis, you can oftentimes derive formulas that you aren't familiar with. I recommend looking up videos on dimensional analysis after you've watched this. 
The last thing that I want to emphasize are the laboratory techniques. The techniques are extremely useful to know since they're bound to come up in questions and in prompts. You'll often be asked to interpret the results of a test or decide which one to use in a given situation. So having lab techniques in your toolbox is bound to get you some questions right. There's even a couple documents that summarize the techniques for you, which I'll link in the description. Next, I want to touch on some flashcard making principles. The first is to seek to understand, then learn, then memorize. If you get this right, you'll waste less time staring at flashcards trying to understand what you're meant to know. Plus, your flashcards are bound to be more accurate and better written if you follow the order of understand, learn, then memorize. If you want to improve your flashcards even more, then you should follow the minimum information principle. This involves keeping the answers to your flashcards as simple as possible. This helps because you're more likely to recall it correctly. And if you can do that, you don't have to review the same information as frequently. The last point about flashcards is that mnemonics should be a last resort. If the understand, learn, memorize sequence doesn't work well for a particular piece of information, or if you're tasked with using a list, then it might be time to try out a mnemonic. Generally speaking, you should limit the use of mnemonics because they have a high time cost to create. I imagine that if someone used only mnemonics to learn everything for the MCAT, this is what would happen. They would probably end up doing content review for far longer than necessary and end up losing track of which mnemonic corresponds with each topic. These three flashcard making principles are by no means a complete list and I could probably make multiple videos on the formulation of good flashcards. For now, if you're interested in learning more, I'll link a blog post with 20 rules for formulating better flashcards. If you enjoyed this video, consider subscribing to the channel. I make new videos every week to help you on your journey to medical school. If you have other questions, feel free to reach out. That's all for now, and thanks for watching.